Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Good morning and afternoon and evening to everyone's connected. Um, I will start my, <clears throat> my webinar on, with the title of New Concept in Microsurgical Treatment of Lymphedema Using Ultrasound Technology. And um, this webinar is uh, within the Learn Online Symposium. And those well, symposium series has been made possible by the general support of uh, this sponsor. And this is the Learn important disclaimer. And I'm Dr. Visconti. Uh, I, uh, I'm a plastic surgeon based in Italy, in Rome. I work at the University Hospital uh, Gemelli, um, which is one of the biggest hospitals uh, of the country. This is my disclosure. Uh, it's a textbook on uh, lymphatic venous anastomosis, published in October 2020. And so I will start my presentation with a brief introduction on the, um, on the main on the main problem on lymphedema. So uh, we know that lymphedema is a chronic, progressive, and debilitating disease characterized by lymph fluid accumulation in the affected area of the body. And uh, we know that this can be primary and secondary. And in the Western world, the most common cause is a secondary to oncologic treatments. And patient, uh, oncologic patient, uh, cancer survivors with, uh, with lymphedema actually are experiencing a therapeutic paradox because in, when they are cured from cancer, they are cured at the expenses of a chronic benign disease. So the diagnosis of lymphedema is, uh, is complex, is not, uh, is not simple, and it, it has uh, different, uh, of course, different parts. We have a clinical history and evaluation to do. Of course, the, the first diagnosis of lymphedema is usually clinically, but clinical, but then we need to do the workup, and then there will be also the measurement part with the volume circumference or other methods. And then there are the uh, instrumental part, the imaging part, which is very important, uh, such as the ICG lymphography, the lymphocytography, uh, the lymph MRI, uh, elastography, and ultrasound. Recognized lymphedema is very important because lymphedema is a, a frequent disease, although is, it is usually underestimated and is referred to swelling of the, of the arm or of the leg. You can see in the, these slides, uh, different uh, stage of lymphedema because this uh, disease, as I said before, is a, is a chronic and progressive disease. And um, you can have a subclinical lymphedema, so, um, almost not uh, visible swelling of the arm of the leg, although there can be symptoms. And we can have uh, a moderate uh, or early stage of lymphedema, which is ISL stage one or stage two, uh, when there is a more evidence of swelling, but this swelling is, um, is, um, is temporarily when it's uh, settled and is not modifying during the day or with movement or with rest it becomes a tube B, and then when we start to have elephantiasic transformation, it becomes stage three. And this um, disease, as I said before, is a chronic and progressive disease. And this progression is different for each patient, either for timing and mode. And this depends not only on adherence to conservative treatments, but the progression is uh, inexorably a feature of this chronic and progressive disease. And uh, the first description about the, uh, the progression of the disease by, ob uh, by observation of the microscopical uh, modification of the lymphatic channel in lymphedema in human extremity were performed by Professor Koshima in 1996. And Professor Koshima uh, reported how the lymphatic channel undergrow a progressive degeneration 
uh, over time. And this is eventually related to um, a, a, prog a, the, a progression of uh, the disease under a clinical point of view. And um, the therapeutic strategies for lymphedema should, uh, should be uh, focused on improving the actual situation and reduce, stop the disease progression. This is the main, uh, the main aim of the therapeutic strategies. And a multidisciplinary evidence-based approach is needed because one of the main therapeutic goals is to contrast the main determinant of the disease evolution, which is the lymphatic hypertension. So this is very important. We need to uh, combine um, different strategies, either surgically, either uh, physically, either um, with other treatments to reduce the, to control the lymphatic hypertension. And so we need a multidisciplinary evidence-based approach against lymphatic hypertension. So mainly we have conservative treatments, which actually reduce temporarily the lymphatic hypertension, as there are usually no true anatomical gateways. This is especially true in secondary disease, in obstructive lymphedema. And then we have physiologic microsurgery, which actually creates new and true anatomical gateways. Those two main um, strategies are actually not one against the other, but they should be seen in conjunction. So is the combination of the most appropriate conservative treatment and physiologic microsurgery, which gives to the patient the best outcome possible and which allows to control the best lymphatic hypertension. I want to share with you this, uh, this, idea, this video, which I found uh, quite interestingly because it actually demonstrates why the combination of physical therapy with uh, um, physiologic microsurgery, in this case, uh, lymphatic ovinous anastomosis, is really important. So now we enter in the, <clears throat> in the operating room. I'm performing a lymphatic ovinous anastomosis on this patient. And you can see here, um, I just uh, performed a lymphatic ovinous anastomosis in, in the leg of this lymphedematous patient. You can see at the screen. Now I'm turning the, uh, the screen into the, um, into the fluorescence mode so we can better see the fluid progression from lymphatic channel to the vein, which I anastomosed. And I apply a gentle pressure on the distal portion of my anastomosis. And you can see how the lymph is really pushed into the venous system. So this video uh, actually demonstrates how conservative treatments applied on an operated limb with lymphatic venous system anastomosis, which will actually boost the effects of our surgery, of our procedure. So it is very important to understand that optimal, optimal treatment is a combination of treatments to reduce the uh, lymphatic hypertension. So the multidisciplinary evidence-based approach should be always considered and not used only for advanced cases. So when conservative treatments fails, because if we think that patient with lymphedema should be referred to surgery when conservative treatment is not anymore um, accepted by the patient on, or is not anymore working as the patient or the therapist wish, then maybe we um, actually lose some occasion because uh, when conservative treatment fails and the patient is not anymore other and sometimes this corresponds to a lymphatic degeneration which actually doesn't allow the surgery to be effective anymore. So we don't need to wait a time before considering surgery. We must, we should consider a combined multidisciplinary approach because waiting may mean wasting unique opportunities. So this is, I think, very important in the um, in approaching lymphedema patient, um, including the new uh, physiologic treatments. Of course, we need to recognize lymphedema. As I said before, this is a, a small shot of our um, of, of our 
um, worksheet in the hospital for uh, uh, getting information for the patient. And then we have the examination, such as the lymphocytography. This is a, actually a rest stress uh, lymphocytography, which gives us a lot of dynamic information about fluid progression and area of lymph stasis. And uh, we have the ICG lymphography, which is a relatively new method. It's a physiologic method, very similar to the lymphocytography as in concept, but of course it's, you, it uses different, um, different technologies, but allows a dynamic and static evaluation. There are no ionizing radiation, minimal contraindication and side effects. And this allow an, you know, um, real-time evaluation of lymphatic channel. You can see on the left uh, a progression of uh, a linear pattern, so a normal progression of lymphatic uh, uh, of lymph fluid within lymphatic channel. You can see the movement of the lymph angel within the within the, the normal uh, arm, and then you can see on the on the video on the right that uh, you know compared to the left you don't have any more linear pattern only but you have a combination of linear pattern and area of lymph extravasation you can see this uh, air, white, uh, white area fluorescent area those are area where the lymph actually actually get out from the lymphatic channels and um, actually those are the area usually of the swelling and you can see how, how nicely you can really see real time the progression of the lymph within the lymph angion up to the axilla in this case on the left. And the ICG lymphography has a staging uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Takumi Yamamoto in Japan for lower limb, for upper limb, we also have for genitalia. And this is another, uh, another uh, staging method which uh, actually uh, gives other information uh, combined with other uh, imaging methods. And then we have another examination, which is the magnetic resonance lymphography, which is a further examination, which also provide uh, anatomical information about lymphatic channel and, uh, and vein. And also it provides information about the volume of the limb. So it's very also uh, powerful in determining the real uh, volume difference between the, uh, the affected limb and the others not affected or, even, or the eventual difference. And when we talk about lymphatic surgery, we, we should understand that we are talking about two main, uh, two main type of surgery. Those are those that are can be called also the bulking procedure, which are actually procedure uh, with the aim of reducing of direct of direct volume reduction of the limb. And those usually uh, includes resection of excess, uh, of excess tissue. Uh, so direct resection of, uh, of excess tissue, like uh, partial resection or total resection, like the Charles procedure, or we have the, the less invasive uh, debulking procedure, which is the liposuction, which actually removes the excess fat that accumulates um, during the limb stasis. And then we have physiologic procedure, which are actually different from the debulking procedure because the physiologic procedure are actually, uh, are actually targeting the lymphatic system, not the consequence of the lymphatic dysfunction, such as the debulking procedure. And those physiologic procedure, uh, the main ones are supermicro lymphatic ovinous anastomosis, a lymphatic tissue transfer, which include lymph node transfer or lymphatic tissue transfer without lymph node. And again, this surgical option must not be seen as one against the others, but again, they should be combined to obtain the best outcome for each case. So some usually the physiologic procedure are combined with liposuction, but in some other cases, uh, some uh, usually partial resection can be also can be also used. And when we think about physiologic lymphedema surgery, we actually, again, need to understand how these surgery are actually working on our lymphatic system. So we have the supermicrosurgical lymphatic ovinous anastomosis, which is actually a bypass surgery. And as, all, as other bypass that we know in, uh, in medicine, like, vascular, like in vascular surgery, this bypass is actually, uh, it usually has a quite a kind of immediate effect uh, because it starts to work as soon as the bypass has been performed. And then we have the lymph node flaps or lymphatic channel transfer, which is actually a bypass through regeneration because the surgeon, um, when performing the lymphatic channel transfer or the lymph node flaps, is not actually performing a direct bypass. 
in the in the lymphatic mesothelium, but is bringing uh, new lymphatic channel, working lymphatic channels, and lymph nodes eventually in the in the affected limb, and is preparing the limb to get uh, a bypass through the through the flaps. But this needs a regeneration progress, uh, process. It means that the lymphatic flaps must uh, in, on, in during time connect with the lymphatic uh, system of the affected limb. And then we can combine, of course, this procedure. So lymphatic channel, lymph node flaps, and lymphatic ominous osmosis. So this creates kind of brainstorm in lymphatic surgery because as we see during this presentation, first we have the staging, and this is just one kind of staging, which is the International Society of Lymphology staging, but there are different uh, type of staging as we see that can be based on imaging and they can be based on combined information. And then we also have the history of lymphedema. It's primary, secondary lymphedema, upper extremity lymphedema are different from lower extremity lymphedema, again, different from pubis area and genital, again, different from other sites, such as breast or head and neck. Uh, so. And then we have the unique information uh, for each patient that uh, the eventual imaging uh, gives to us, such as lymphocytography, ICG lymphography, eventual aspect, uh, magnetic resonance lymphography. And also we must consider comorbidities of the patient because they can, uh, they can contribute to uh, the, the, clinical, uh, the clinical situation of the patient. So, all this information must be combined and then how can we choose the best indication for the patient or eventually we also should include no uh, no uh, criteria for uh, no inclusion criteria for surgery so sometimes some patients are have, have no indication for surgery we also must um, must understand that so how uh, what kind of um, surgical procedure can we offer to our patient then if we can offer a surgical procedure to our patient so how and when and what is the best for that case so in all this kind of information we must analyze the single and unique feature of each patient. Lymphatic, uh, lymphatic system is very complex and lymphatic surgery, in my opinion, must be personalized for each uh, lymphedema patient because each lymphedema patient has his own uh, features, not only anatomically, not only pathologically, but also eventually with comorbidities. So when we talk about lymphatic ominous anosmosis, we are talking about, I'm talking about the, uh, the super microsurgical technique. It means, uh, peripheral and central lymphatic ominous anastomosis with intima to intima coaptation. This is a physiologic super microsurgical procedure. Is the uh, um, with this procedure we are actually diverting the lymph flow toward the blood circulation. We know that lymphatic uh, system uh, is actually an open system with, which uh, 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 which uh, um, finally drains into the venous system. So. With the lymphatic ominous anastomosis, we are actually anticipating uh, the diversion of lymph flow toward the blood circulation using peripheral vein. So the aim is to bypass lymphatic channel into subdermal venule. And why this is called super microsurgical procedure? Because uh, this includes manipulation of uh, structure, which has a caliber and a dimension which is below 0.8 millimeter. In the last 10 years, the surgical treatment of lymphedema has been revolutionized with the establishment of functional procedure that we talked before, and the microsurgical revolution corresponding to imaging evolution. And imaging and surgery in lymphedema are very strictly correlated more than any other field in microsurgery. Why? Because the knowledge of normal lymphatic anatomy is still not full, and there's variability among subjects. And because pathological lymphatic anatomy, so the anatomy in the lymphedema patients, is even less clear and more variable. We know that lymphatic ominous anastomosis and or lymphatic flaps usually works well in early and moderate stage lymphedema because lymphatic channel can be visualized with conventional technologies. So it's, it's kind of uh, easier for the surgeon to plan the surgery and to uh, you know, decide 
which kind of treatment should be offered to their patient. But contrast-based technologies, such as lymphocytography, ICG lymphography, magnetic resonance um, lymphography, are limited by the lymphosome concept. It means that when we inject the contrast to highlight the lymphatic system, we may have that, we may found the situation when the injection point do not enlighten the channel, but this means that the injected point is not clearly connected to a functional lymphatic channel, but it does not mean that there are non-functional lymphatic channels. I think this is a very uh, important point because we should not refrain to understand if there are eventually lymphatic channels still present in the limb, which can be salvaged by the lymphatic venous anastomosis, for example, surgery, but that we cannot salvage because we cannot see them. So we, we should... Uh, we sh should understand that it is possible that not always contrast-based technology allows to visualize lymphatic channels. So how to manage the advanced stage lymphedema or cases that are not advanced but without clearly visible lymphatic channel at contrast-based examination? So we need to combine clinical and ultrastructural information on lymphatic, of lymphatic channel to understand the real staging of the patient. And when I talk about real staging, I talk about the degree of degeneration of lymphatic channel. It's not the volume of the limb that tell us the real staging of the patient, but is the degeneration of lymphatic channels that tell us the real degeneration of the patient and the real staging. So we must combine the three Fs, so the, the clinical examination of the limb, so amount of fat, fluid fibrosis of each limb, and lymphatic degeneration in each patient, in each limb, in each part of the limb, because the degeneration of lymphatic channel is different, can be different, and it is usually different in different area of the affected limb. So how can, can we have both information with ultrasound? So successful result with LVA are possible when functional lymphatic channel are bypassed. And you can see in this video, lymphatic pump before lymphatic venous anastomosis. This is a cut lymphatic channel, which is ectasis. And you can see the lymph flow in this lymphatic channel. And also when outlet recipient venules are used, after we establish a lymphatic venous anastomosis, we want to see that the lymph is cleared into the venous system. You can see the video on the right. After lymphatic venous anastomosis, you can see the fluorescence within the vein. You see the flow into the vein. It, it means that our lymphatic venous anastomosis is really working. And this we want to see in our, in our patient. It means that the lymph is going out from the, from the limb. So we are really reducing lymphatic hypertension. So why ultrasound changed my practice? I believe that ultrasound is the key, is the quintessence in lymphatic surgery. And you can see we, we published the first application of ultrasound-assisted lymphatic venous anastomosis for the treatment of peripheral lymphedema in 2017 with my uh, dear colleague and friends from Japan, uh, Dr. Uh, Akita Tsuayashi and Dr. Uh, Yamamoto. And you can see why the ultrasound is the key. This is an imaging of uh, uh, median nerve. You can see the high frequency ultrasound, 15 megahertz, can show you the median nerve very clearly. But when you use ultra high frequency ultrasound, such as the 70 megahertz, you can count the fascicle of the median nerve. It means that you have imaging that are comparable to histology. And this is, of course, a new word for uh, lymphedema surgery. So I started using the ultrasound after I came back from my experience in Japan. And then we started to use uh, the ultra high frequency ultrasounds in 2000. Uh, 16 in my in my hospital and the first uh, the pioneer of ultrasound visualization of lymphatic vessel in the world like is my dear friend uh, Dr. Ayash. So with ultrasound we can visualize tiny anatomy not visible with conventional ultrasound. And the magic of ultra high frequency ultrasound is visualize very tiny structures such as lymphatic channel and perforator because the 70 megahertz probe allow you to give a, a, a focal resolution of 30 micrometer and the 48 a focal resolution of 50 micrometer. 
and it expands knowledge of the very superficial anatomy. So the ultrasound methods combine clinical and ultrastructural evaluation. You can see this is a, a, an advanced stage lymphedema with pitting edema in, uh, in the hand. And with our ultrasound, we can see what the ICG lymphography and the lymphocytography did not show us. It's not possible in this kind of limb to see linear pattern, but with ultrasound, we can find many lymphatic channel, uh, nice uh, subdermal volume. So we can really understand where we can put our incision. And you can see comparison between right and left limb. The ultrasound methods combine clinical and histological information. This is a very important point. We published this study very recently uh, in 2020 on the JPRAS, and uh, we found that the imaging that we get with the ultra high frequency ultrasound is actually comparable to histologic evaluation of the lymphatic channel. So ultrasound allows a comprehensive and clinical definition of lymphedema severity before surgery because uh, it allows to understand the lymphatic degeneration, the amount of fluid, fibrosis, and fat. So it really gives all the instruments uh, to really uh, perform a good surgical selection of the patient and allow to select surgery and eventually predict LVA efficacy because it allows to understand the real degeneration status of our lymphatic channels. And we know that if we are performing surgical procedure, no matter if this is LVA or lymph node transfer or lymphatic tissue transfer in a severely damaged, uh, uh, in a patient with severely damaged lymphatic channel, we will have a very minimal therapeutic effects. And this is important. The trend is changing because RVA are effective also for advanced stage lymphedema. This is uh, the first publication for uh, um, Dr. Uh, Johnson Yang from Taiwan. And this is from Dr. J. P. Yong, and our publication is coming soon. The key is the ability to find lymphatic channel also when conventional technique cannot. So we must act as a truffle dog using ultrasound, see what the contrast-based imaging cannot uh, allow to see, and then go beyond the traditional indication for lymphatic ominous anastomosis. And ultrasound is also very important when we are talking about lymphatic ominous anastomosis because we can really select our exit point for supermicrosurgical lymphatic anastomosis. I first published the, this uh, classification of uh, uh, the flow dynamic um, classification of LVA in uh, Journal of Reconstructive Surgery in 2017. And then after four years, we update this publication with, uh, with an algorithm based on 1,000 lymphatic ominous anastomosis because the venule is an independent factor on the surgical outcome of LVA. So the ultrasound allows high fidelity um, preparative, um, preparative evaluation for location, dimension, and further dynamic of the vein. You can see we mark preparatively with the, with the marking pen, and there is a high fidelity of either dimension of the vein, position of the vein. We can really perform very, uh, very precise and, and working functioning lymphatic ominous anastomosis, such as in this case. You can see other images which really shows how there is a high correspondence in between location and dimension and the function of the vein that we select. And ultra high frequency uh, ultrasound increase also efficiency and creativity. Uh, it allows, for example, to perform a vein rerouting method in case where we found a good lymphatic channel, but we don't have a good recipient venue nearby, nearby our channel. So this allows to, uh, again, bring the exit veins toward the lymphatic channel and allows to perform a working lymphatic ominous anastomosis, although in the area of the lymphatic channel, there is no recipient venule, and you cannot know this information before, uh, before surgery. And when you are in the surgery, you must know where is your eventual venule rerouting. Otherwise, you cannot perform it. And you can see here another outlet lymphatic ominous anastomosis, and it allows also planning of more complex lymphatic ominous anastomosis such, such as ELBA. You can see in the, uh, in the video on the left, the ultra high frequency allows to see the lymph node, to see the efferent channels, 
to see the recipient venue. So you already know with kind of, uh, what kind of procedure you are going to perform. And then you can perform your ELVA uh, with high precision. Ultrasound allowed to expand LVA indication from this patient, which are early to moderate stage, to this patient, which are actually advanced stage lymphedema. And effective LVA usually gives immediate impressive result already visible on the operating table and working more and more over the weeks because this bypass start to work right after. You can see 12 hours after surgery, I can pinch very clearly the skin. There is a reduction of lymph stasis. The, the lymph is reducing in, uh, um, in uh, uh, lymph stasis. You can see here, how, how can I pinch the skin of the... Of the um, of the patients. And again, another case, uh, after 12 hours after surgery, you can see deflation of the lymph accumulation. And in the, you know, in the left, you see the, the patient before and after uh, one year. But again, results are already, uh, are already visible after, after surgery, sometimes even on the operating table. It expands LVA indication also to this kind of patient. And this patient did, uh, actually did not want uh, a complete liposuction, but he can undergo liposuction to further reduce you know, the fat accumulation, but only LVA reduces the amount of, of fluid accumulation. And those are other cases. To your postoperative, you can see um, deflation of the, of the right upper limb in a case of uh, uh, secondary upper limb lymphedema after <clears throat> breast cancer, uh, breast cancer treatments, and with a 48% volume reduction and stable results. Another case this is a secondary secondary lymphedema after necrotizing necrotizing fasciitis, uh, who has a complete resolution re resolution of complete regression of lymphedema because it was not an obstructive lymphedema but related to uh, to surgery and first trauma and then surgery. And then another case, you can see this patient has also quite a lot of fat accumulation, but only the lymphatic surgery allowed to have a reduction of volume of 44% with small incision. And again, you can see the, you know, the little scar are different in each patient because this surgery is personalized. There is no one single incision, uh, which, is, uh, which is the same in all the patient. This is a personalized approach. Every patient has his own incision with own uh, position, own number of incision, because each patient has his uh, own, its own uh, lymphatic anatomy. Another case, a male after uh, uh, axillary lymph node dissection for melanoma of the shoulder, and you can see 74% volume reduction after two years. Again, with a personalized approach using ultra high frequency ultrasound to localize lymphatic channel uh, very precisely. And another patient with the uh, uh, lower limb lymphedema of the right limb after 10 months with a 51% uh, volume reduction. And uh, again, um, good response to this, to this procedure. And also for some primary cases, like this patient with a 55 volume reduction, lymphedema since. Um, the age of uh, uh, a very small age, so around 12 years old. So he suffered lymphedema for 35 years and um, with uh, uh, one episode of, with more than one episode of, uh, um, of lymphangitis and he responded very well to lymphatic ovinous anastomosis. And again, another patient, a combination of lymph node sampling and knee trauma with recurrent uh, lymphangitis, also with a good response to lymphatic ovinous anastomosis. Mm -hmm. And again, another <clears throat> primary case, these patients um, two years after surgery with a 76% uh, of volume reduction, uh, again, uh, uh, very important reduction of, uh, of the volume, but also amelioration of the skin quality and, uh, and in general, quality of life. And ultrasound is not only important in uh, supermicrosurgical lymphatic ovinous anastomosis, but is important also in lymphatic tissue transfer. When we are doing uh, lymph node FRAP or lymphatic channel FRAPs, we are actually performing uh, a bypass through regeneration. It means that we are not controlling the bypass, such as 
in lymphatic ominous osmosis, where we are actually performing the bypass, but we are bringing new vital lymphatic tissue within a compromised limb uh, for lymphatic tissue with the aim to reduce lymph stasis by introducing a new draining station through regeneration because we need lymphagiogenesis over time to allow the new draining station to be connected to the affected limb, so to drain the affected limb. So the regeneration is provided by the flap itself. Lymph node flap has a, has a, a relatively short history. Same things apply to lymphatic ovinous anastomosis. So different pioneers in, uh, uh, in lymph node flaps. And common, common technical point are those flap are compound flap. It means the lymphatic tissue and lymph nodes are with their adipocutaneous component. We have a limited dissection and freedom compared to other microsurgical flap because we don't want to interrupt lymphatic tissue and connection with lymph nodes. So we need to preserve eventual natural lymphovenous connection and preserve natural lymphatic connection, of course. So continuity of the channels and connection to lymph nodes. So in those flap, it's very important to have a precise knowledge of microvascular lymphatic anatomy. And for lymph node flap or, or list flap, I use ICG, CT scan, and ultrasound. And for lymphatic tissue flap, I use ICG and ultrasound. We know that lymph node flaps can be uh, cutaneous lymph node flaps, such as in these cases, inguinal base, supraclavicular, lateral thoracic flaps. But we also have visceral lymph node flaps, such as omentum flap or uh, uh, mesenteric flap. There are still many open questions about uh, lymph node flaps. And um, this is a case example of a, um, a lateral thoracic lymphatic flap with skin monitor inserted according to lymphocytic concept uh, described by Dr. Yamamoto. This is very important. And you can see the patient has a uh, two years follow up uh, with, uh, with good improvement. So, in these cases, it's very important to understand the microvascular features and lymphatic features of the flap. Otherwise, we cannot design correctly the flaps. And uh, we introduced with uh, uh, my dear friend Hideiko Yoshimatsu and Dr. Akita Tsuayashi the lymphatic system transfer flaps for lymphedema. It means that we transfer our lymphosome and block according to ICG preparative markings using reverse mapping and again using ultrasound for vascular and lymph node mapping. And we inset again according to lymphaxiality concept. So we harvest. In this case, is the the, uh, the groin uh, list flaps, and then you can see intraoperatively in the channel green lymphography showing uh, the 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 lymph the entire lymphosome harvested on the on the um, superficial circumplex uh, circumplex vessel. You can see lymphatic channels going down, getting another lymphatic channel converging within a lymph node. You can see now there is the lymph node and there is another more superficial lymph node already included in the flaps. And our pedicle is just below. This is an entire lymphosome harvested from the groin area and inserted according to lymphocytic concept in the, in the upper limb. And why ultrasound is important in lymph node flap? Because it allows to clarify all the microanatomy. We want to know how the lymph node is connected to the, uh, to the for example, the, the skia vessel, the, the vessel for the, for the skin, the peripheral for the skin, the connection of the vein of the lymph node helium. Is it connected to the skia vein? Is it connected to the, to the skiff? So we need to know that because we need to design and understand how to drain not only the, the skin of the lymph node flaps, but moreover, the lymph, our lymph node. And we can see clearly the inguinal lymph node, we can see the helium uh, and this connection and the underpower doppler, we have a clear demonstration of that, that in this case, the venue of lymph node helium is clearly connected to the skip. So we know that in this case, if you are bypassing the skip as a venous out, uh, output, instead of uh, comitantes of the skia, we are actually giving a better chance to our lymph node to drain out the lymph. And you see some example of uh, uh, Doppler planning and uh, design, including ICG and in setting accordingly, according to the lymphaxiality concept. Again, the ultrasound is really important to design and have all this design on the skin. And any preferred flaps, according to its lymphaxiality, can be used as a lymphatic flaps and ultrasound 
guiding choosing the plane of elevation by precise microvascular anatomical information. And we published that in Archives of Plastic Surgery in 2020. So in conclusion, the microsurgical treatment of lymphedema is an, is an established treatment. The knowledge of lymphedema is still low. Preoperative planning is crucial. A truffle throw dog attitude in searching lymphatic channel is needed, and we should not rely only on contrast-based imaging. So strict protocols should be avoided as each patient is unique. And this is very important. We really need a personalized approach for each patient. And ultrasound revolution my practice because allows to have a personalized approach is the quintessence in emphatic surgery. And our technical, technical skills are needed to master this procedure. And for all those who are interested, we are um, organizing um, a very nice meeting with uh, a lot of uh, based for uh, especially for lymphedema surgery in Taiwan next September 22-24. Hopefully the COVID will not restrict and will not postpone this event. Thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. And now I will go on the question and answer box, Q&A box. And I will, <clears throat> I will read So elastography uh, so, um, is unfamiliar to me. What is it, please? Uh, and what is the lymphedema prevalence in Italy? Estimated figure. So elastography is a type of, uh, um, if a type of technology that can be, um, can be included in the ultrasound evaluation. So it is a modality of ultrasound that allows to understand the um, elasticity of the tissue. And it has been used in the past to understand and to grade also the severity of lymphedema. And lymphedema prevalence in Italy, uh, I can say is actually around 40,000 new cases a year. Uh, so it's, uh, of course, this, this uh, number includes primary and secondary lymphedema for each kind of etiology. So when someone is diagnosed as primary lymphedema, and they seem like they are in stage two as the fluids only diffuses in the ICG, should the patient undergo liposuction to be able to do LVA or transfer? So this question is, uh, includes many, <clears throat> many points. So um, as I said before, staging of lymphedema must not be connected to the volume of the limb. It should be connected to the actual lymphatic degeneration because the volume of the limb can be connected, for example, just for a recent lymphangitis, actually double or triple the volume of the limb, but this is not the real volume. So there, are, there can be many factors uh, that can determine the uh, volume of limb or uh, not well-performed conservative treatment. So I think before considering uh, the type of procedure to perform, the lymphatic anatomy, the pathologic lymphatic anatomy must be clarified. Uh, and then based on that, we can decide how to move within the, uh, within the surgical options. So with the ultimate goal of reducing lymphatic hypertension, do you think it would be valuable to also image the lymphatic of the trunk, especially in those patients who had surgery to the trunk? increasing the risk of injury to the central lymphatic, I would think this would be necessary. This is uh, for sure an interesting question. And uh, of course, we must understand, uh, and that's why the <clears throat> clinical evaluation analysis is very important, collecting information about each patient, because we must understand the level of obstruction. Of course, uh, we, and then we must proceed proceed toward the obstruction. We also know that lymphatic degeneration is actually uh, centrifuge. So more we go far from our obstruction, more we can we can do with our lymphatic channel. But for uh, of course, in some cases we we should also image the uh, lymphatic of the trunk. Oh, this is also. Um, a very important observation, I think, um, 
for 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 giving that. So you say you mentioned that post cancer patient makes up the majority of lymphedema patient in the Western world. Recent prevalence results from the International Lymph Print Study indicate that morbid obesity is the highest risk factor. What is your experience with obese patient? I completely agree with this kind of observation. Of course, at least in uh, in uh, in Italy, the uh, according to um, to recent uh, uh, prevalence study, uh, oncologic. Uh, oncologic patients are the most affected by by lymphedema, but of course it's not a matter of uh, which is first and which is second. As you said, it's very important. The morbid obesity is one of the highest risk factor. I completely agree with that. There are publication uh, on important journals um, that demonstrates that uh, morbid obesity is a risk factor for lymphedema. And uh, my experience with obese patient uh, is uh, is the same. We usually have, I sometimes see morbid obese patient with, uh, which are actually referring to my outpatient clinic, uh, searching for uh, surgery to improve the swelling of the limb. And uh, in these cases, of course, the reply is, first control obesity because this is the main risk factor and the cause of lymphedema so this is very important point i think for your question because we always uh, must uh, understand and remember that also other factors such as obesity is not only a risk factor but in some cases can be the unique uh, factor which actually bring the lymphedema so the patient uh, um, are still wearing compression after surgery LBA. So this is again, um, uh, thank you for your question. Of course, this is a generic question. As I said before, we cannot use, we cannot uh, make, you know, general conclusion. Um, lymphatic macronotomy is different from each patient. The staging is different. The type of surgery we can do is different. So each patient will, will undergo uh, uh, an evaluation in a strict evaluation in the post-operative time. So we see how, uh, so based on how many LVA, which kind of LVA we, we did perform, we can guide the patient in the eventual post-operative compression. Some patient, as you see in the picture before, stop wearing compression at all. They are not either upper limb or lower limb. Some other may need compression. Sometimes in, in some moment of the, of the weeks or of the year, uh, so this is this must be personalized for each patient. So do you prefer liposuction before microscopy surgery? No, I I never do the liposuction before or during microscopy surgery because I first uh, like to manage the um, the lymphatic accumulation, lymphatic hypertension, and after the result is stabilized, eventually after six or nine months, I will consider. Uh, excess excess fat and then perform the liposuction. So, what is the risk of uh, developing lymphedema on the area where the flap was harvested? The risk is is high, of course. It has been described, and um, this uh, this apply especially for uh, <clears throat> for cutaneous flap. And but of course we have so Dr. Uh, Dr. Joseph, Joseph Diane described the reverse mapping, uh, which all lymphatic surgeons uh, nowadays are using when harvesting lymphatic flaps to avoid, of course, the damaging lymphatic channel of the limb. So this applies for groin lymph node or for lateral thoracic lymph node, but also for supraclavicular lymph node sometimes. So we must avoid to uh, <clears throat> to harvest the lymph node which are draining the the lower limbs or the upper upper limb to avoid iatrogenic lymphedema. So is LVA performed also main genital lymphedema? Of course, yes. It's also effective. And another question is, do you consider ICG lymphography to be sufficient enough for conducting LVAs? Uh, so I... Um, as I say in the presentation, I believe that ultrasound is the real quintessence. So, uh, of course, in some cases, ICG can be enough, but uh, uh, I believe that, uh, if possible, combination of procedure gives much more information. 
Do patients have to travel to Italy only? I live in the US. So uh, of course, uh, Italy is a very nice country and uh, we welcome all the patients, but also in the US, of course, you find very, uh, very experienced colleague that can perform this procedure. So how do we find centers of excellence that can provide advanced ultrasound guided evaluation? So this is also an interesting uh, question. We may, um, of course, it's not complicated on the, uh, you know, uh, seeing within the center of excellence, the centers which are performing ultra frequency, but this can be, this can be eventually included in the information for the, in the center of excellence. So for a patient with new onset lymphedema, post mastectomy and lymph node dissection, how much time would you wait for improvement with conservative therapy before proceeding to surgery? So very interesting question again. So I think that, again, these questions is, is uh, I think a little bit uh, related to some kind of old uh, thinking about treatment of lymphedema. So conservative therapy and surgery are not one against the other or one the opposite of the other. They must work together. So if there is an obstructive lymphedema, of course, there can be edema after, after surgery, we are, but we are talking about uh, you know, real lymphedema, not uh, post-operative uh, edema. And uh, after the, the, the treatments are, uh, are finished and there is a, uh, uh, you know, a diagnosis of lymphedema, physiotherapist and microsurgeon must talk together. And all the patient, I think, should undergo a microsurgical evaluation in, of course, in center of excellence that are performing this procedure to understand if there is indication for surgery, not all patient should undergo surgery. Patient selection is very important to uh, provide the best outcome for each patient, but uh, most of patient can undergo surgery and they should, uh, you know, uh, enjoy the combined treatment, surgery and conservative therapy, because only the combined procedure really gives, uh, allows to give the best results. So are these techniques option in the head and neck or torso? It seems most physiological lymphedema surgery are performed in limbs. Thank you for your question. Yes, of course. Uh, limbs, of course, are among the most you know, common areas of lymphedema, but those techniques are already applied in other areas, such as head and neck, such as breast, such as genitalia. So yes, the reply is yes. Thank you, Learn and Dr. Visconti for interesting presentation from the cradle of lymphology, Saluti uh, Dottava, and I send my regards to Canadian, <coughs> Canadian colleagues. So I think I went over uh, your question. I didn't mention all of them, but I tried to mention uh, those were, uh, you know, very uh, kind of similar to each other. And uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed this, uh, this, this webinar. And I would like to thank again, uh, learn for the great opportunity and for all the efforts they are performing every day worldwide for uh, spreading the culture of uh, uh, lymphatic disease and lymphedema treatment and to help more and more patients to, uh, to get the best treatment possible. Thank you again for giving me this space and I hope to uh, see you in the future, either virtually or live. Goodbye.